So today we're going to talk about um, kinematics. And since um, we, we had all of this stuff last year, we're going to go super quick. Um, and, it, and it should just really get you up to speed. Now, an important aspect of, of what we're going to talk about here um, is, that, is that this is constant acceleration kinematics. So constant acceleration kinematics. And one of the things that's going to separate this year from, from last year is that last year, that's all we dealt with was the idea of constant acceleration. This year, um, we're going to have, uh, it'll, it'll, vary, it'll vary two ways, okay? Number one, um, last year was all constant acceleration kinematics. And therefore, we always lived in the average with the equations that we developed. And those equations were all good with respect to constant acceleration. This year's a little different in, in two realms. Number one, we're not always dealing with constant acceleration. And we, if, we, if we're not dealing with constant acceleration, then we can't use the equations we are about ready to develop. Um, but the good news is, is, is we're going to have some calculus. And, and um, that will enable us to deal with non-constant um, accelerations. But for now, for today, let's just stick with this idea of constant acceleration um, kinematics. All right. Now, um, to, to start with, then, let's, let's just start with um, the staircase that I like to use with respect to our quantities here. We've got x, we've got v, and, and we've got a. And uh, the staircase I feel is is good because it illustrates the relationships between these um, these quantities and how they are basically the, the same thing, right? So so this x represents our displacement, right? V represents velocity, and a represents acceleration. And those quantities are all, all kind of um, related to each other, right? So this displacement here is the difference between where we start and where we end. So it's the difference between the start and the end. Now, technically speaking, um, this displacement is a vector quantity. So it requires both a magnitude and a direction. But... Um, you know, more often than not, we're just worried about the direction or the, the magnitude rather. And we let the, the direction kind of like, uh, you know, slide by. So for the most part, it's a numerical difference between where we start and where we end. Now, now this velocity number, right, is also a vector. All three of these things are, are, are vectors, right? Um, but the, the magnitude of the number is what we are we are most worried about. This velocity here is the rate of change of displacement, right? So the average velocity, V bar, is equal to delta X over delta T. There's our rate of change of displacement. And then if we accelerate an object, we have a rate of change of velocity. How quickly does your velocity change? So our average acceleration is delta V over delta T. Now look at last year, because we were always dealing with constant acceleration kinematics, we just left off this bar for the acceleration part. In our in our class this year, we can't leave this bar off because we will be dealing with non-constant accelerations. And this staircase goes down even further, and we'll get to that in the coming days when we talk about these non-constant accelerations. But for now, let's just stick with this idea of constant accelerations. And, and, and here's our main ideas, right? We have this displacement. If we change the displacement, we've got velocity. If we change velocity, we've got acceleration. And, and that's what the staircases do. You can see the relationship between the middle staircase and the top staircase is the same as between the bottom staircase and the middle staircase. Now, again, middle and top are relative because the staircase does continue um, with, with other quantities that we're not going to refer to today. All right. So um, 
you know, our our units kind of mesh with this, right? Our units for velocity are meters per second. In other words, how quickly does the displacement change? Well, the displacement changes by perhaps three meters per second. That's the rate of change of displacement. Our acceleration is in meters per second per second. How quickly does our velocity change? Perhaps it changes at a rate of four meters per second per second. All right. So these are kind of like two ideas where um, uh, the, the kinematics take hold. And, and, and we can use these kinematic ideas to develop um, other equations that will help us throughout the process, okay? And and we referred last year to these things as, a, as our toolbox. And, and this year is no different. As long as we have constant accelerations, we can use our toolbox filled with equations. Um, so if, if we take this idea right here, um, and, and we talk about this average acceleration being delta V over delta T, all right? Now, a couple things end up happening here. First off, this delta right? Um, obviously, we know that that means change. And, and anytime we have uh, change in something, um, we have this idea of final minus initial, right? So, so delta anything really equates final minus initial, right? So delta V is V final minus V initial all over delta T. So if we clean this thing up a little bit, um, we get A delta T and, and bring the V initial over and we, and we can add that. And V initial plus A delta T is equal to V final. And if we, if we want to lump some things, right, like that's important for us to understand. This is important for us to understand. And in reality, what I have circled over there is really just an offshoot of this. Now, now the offshoot of that makes sense, makes total sense. Let's think about this. If the acceleration was zero, that would mean our speed would be constant or uniform. So we have this idea of uniform motion being a constant velocity or a constant speed in the same direction. So if this acceleration has a value of zero, that goes away. And my V initial is the same thing as my, my V final. So this makes total perfect sense. If I have an acceleration, then that acceleration rate is changing the speed by a certain amount for each particular second, right? So so let's let's put some numbers in there. Everybody loves numbers, right? So let's say our initial velocity is two meters per second, but there's no acceleration. So this term goes to zero. Then our final velocity will also equal two meters per second. But if our speed changes at a rate, so if the acceleration is three meters per second per second, that means our speed is changing or our velocity is changing at a rate of three meters per second every single second. Now that change could be a plus three or it could be a minus three. The pluses and minus on all these vector quantities simply mean direction. So we could have a plus or a minus to that three, but it basically means for every single second, our speed is going to go up by three meters per second, right? So let's take the same two meters per second that we start at, and we're going to change that speed by three meters per second per second, and we're going to do that for four seconds. So what would our change in speed be, right? Well, our, our change in speed would be three meters per second every second for four seconds. So that's going to change by 12 seconds or by 12 meters per second, rather. If I started at two and I change by 12, then my final velocity is going to be 14 meters per second. So this thing makes total perfect sense. And it's important for us to understand that we developed this series of equations that all make total sense. And they're really all based off of these two ideas right over here.
Now, another one that comes into play, again, if I, if I have these initial um, and final velocities, right? So, oh, so let's go back to that, right? So in that particular case, my initial velocity was two meters per second, and my final velocity was 14 meters per second. Now, as long as I am dealing with constant acceleration kinematics, then my initial and my final um, are arrived at, right? So if I have my initial, my final is arrived at by me changing my speed at a constant rate. And as long as I do that, then the idea of an average velocity is similar to um, how you would get your average in a, in a class, right? If you take two quizzes and you get a two on one quiz, you get a 14 on another quiz, the average score is just going to be two plus 14 or 16 divided by two. An average, sorry, an average score of, of eight meters per second. So my average velocity then is just initial velocity plus final velocity divided by two. Again, another equation that is important for us to know and understand, another equation that also only matches or meshes when we have this constant acceleration kinematics. So if I were to go over and, and do uh, basically set up a little toolbox here as far over as, as I can so that you can see it, right? My average velocity is delta x over delta t. I have this other expression, average velocity is initial plus final divided by two. My basic idea or understanding of acceleration is that average acceleration is delta V over delta T. We saw how that expands to the idea of V final equals V initial plus my rate of acceleration times delta T. And in reality, we can mix and match these equations to come up with two other important equations that we need to have in our little toolbox, okay? And um, one of those is what we call the no time equation, V final squared equals V initial squared plus two times A times delta X. And we would use that when, when we're not given time within our particular parameters. And then the other one um, that um that that we used the last year um is, is the idea of delta x equals v initial t plus one and a half a t squared and and this is a super important one for us we're going to leave it sit there for now but in reality when we go um and utilize our, our calculus we're going to come back and, and we're going to revisit this certainly in a much different way for now, it's okay if we just leave this sit as is, and we understand that if we're dealing with constant um, uh, acceleration kinematics, then we can stick with that toolbox set right there. And that's the quick overview of all of our quantities for, for um, uh, kinematics, right, or our major quantities, and how they lay out if we have constant acceleration. And all that is fine and dandy, but like utilizing those things as you have to for your seven or eight homework problems can often be difficult. So let's take a look at an example here um, that, 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 we can, that we can utilize. All right. So um, if I get rid of everything except for my toolbox, I'm going to keep that um, idea up here of constant acceleration kinematics. Because again, it's super important for us to understand now that there are situations in our course this year where we can't utilize this stuff. Last year, we could always utilize this because we were only dealing with constant acceleration kinematics. Um, this year, um, we've got some situations where, where our acceleration won't necessarily be constant, okay? All right, so look at, we're gonna utilize those toolbox and our basic problem solving uh, understanding to, to figure this stuff out. So a car traveling at a constant speed of 15 meters per second passes a police officer at rest. At the exact instant the car passes the police officer, the officer accelerates at a rate of three meters per second per second, right? So in essence, you know, this is what happens when you get caught speeding. If this right here is a police car, 
with a speed of zero just simply waiting for you to pass by it. And you, as a speeder, I'm going to put S for speeder, passes that car traveling 15 meters per second, maybe in a speed zone that is only 10 meters per second, for instance. What happens? Well, because this car is moving and the police officer is not moving, very quickly this car gets ahead of the police car. But the police car begins to accelerate and goes faster, 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 faster. It has to do that in order to make up ground. And this is the logical way that this plays out when we come to the motion of these two things. All right, so here's our two questions. How much time elapses before the officer catches up with the car? So, so again, you know, like, like what happens? If my black marker is the speeder and my red marker is the officer, well, this speeder is going to be way out ahead. But the officer is going to have to accelerate in order to make up ground. And ultimately, when the police officer catches up with the car, that's when the police officer pulls the car over. Well, if we take a look at all of our toolboxes, all right, this one down here at the bottom is, in my opinion, by far the most important, right? Like, like this and this are just basic definitions. This, well, this is just this thing algebraically rewritten. And this is another concept um, as far as the average velocity. This thing right here, um, is is important because it's got no time in it. This thing is most important because it's essentially a function of motion or location with respect to time. And it's also most important because it's super logical. So let's take that thing and let's let's put it right here, right? So delta x equals v initial t plus one half a t squared. And I'm going to get rid of this constant acceleration kinematics because I'm going to need the space, but just keep that in mind as to what that is. Now, let's think about this. We've got the police car that has a speed initially of zero. Let's make it V initial of zero. And we have a speeder down here, A sub S, that is zero. Well, up here, my acceleration of the police car, A sub P, is equal to 3 meters per second per second. So this function for our location or our displacement for each of these things becomes different. Think about it. If I want to talk about the delta X of the speeder, the speeder has an initial speed of 15 meters per second, but it is also accelerating at a rate of zero, meaning its speed does not change. So this equation up here, which again, can essentially serve as a function of the location with respect to time, this part goes away. So the location of the speeder is just simply the speeder's speed times time. So let, let's call this V sub S over here. Now, if I take that same delta X equation, V initial T plus one half A T squared, and now I specify it for the police officer, a similar thing happens that ends up you know, basically reversed. The initial speed of the police officer is zero. So the police officer's um, portion of the equation there turns to zero. And I have one half the acceleration of the police officer times time or, or delta t. Um, and as I'm looking at this, I got this written wrong over here. Delta S does not equal V sub S equals t. It's, it's V sub S times t. And this is one half the acceleration times t squared. All right, well, now look at this. How much time elapses before the officer catches up with the car? 
right? We're beyond just simple substitution into here. We got to use our mind. Well, if the car, if the if the police officer catches up with the car, then we know that delta x for the speeder is the same as delta x for the police officer, right? If it catch if the police officer catches up a hundred meters away, then delta x for each of those vehicles is a hundred meters. So in reality, how do we solve for this particular question right here? All right, well, delta x sub s must equal delta x sub p. That's our thought process. What are we trying to solve for here? We're trying to solve for time here, right? So v sub s times t must equal one half the acceleration of the police officer times t squared. If we do some algebra here, 2 times the velocity of the speeder divided by the acceleration of the police officer would have to give us the amount of time it takes for the police officer to catch up with the speeder. Now, we, we could plug those numbers in there, but the numbers don't matter that much to me. The idea is what matters to me. What's the officer's speed? when he catches the car. All right, well, well, look at this. What's the officer's final speed when he catches the car? Well, the officer's final speed must be something different than his initial speed or her, depending on whether the officer is a male or female, right? My final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the change in time. Well, we're after the final velocity of the officer. His or her initial velocity is zero. So then this final velocity must equal a times t, all right? But our t value, right? That's acceleration of the police officer. But our t value is twice, oops, so we've got a sub p here. Our t value is twice the velocity of the speeder divided by the acceleration of the police officer. And lo and behold, the final velocity of the police officer must be twice the velocity of the speeder. Now let's think about that. That makes total perfect sense because for a, the early portion of this thing, the police officer is trailing the speeder. So the police officer has to spend some time with it with its average speed as less than or its instantaneous speed at less than 15 meters per second. Well it's got to spend an equal amount making its speed greater, right? So that its average speed, think about this, the police car and the speeder have to go equal distances in equal time frames. Well, if they go equal distances in equal time frames, then their average speed must be the same. Well, what's the only way for its average speed to be the same as the speeders? If this is zero, its final must be twice the speed of the speeder. So that final velocity ends up as twice the value of the speeder's um, velocity. And how far have the two vehicles gone when the officer catches up? We just simply take this time frame and plug it back in up into here to figure out the distance that either of those things have gone. That's constant acceleration kinematics. Most of this is problem solving, and we'll be doing some problem solving in class today as well.